Good afternoon, folks. How's everyone doing? A super warm Thursday afternoon. Give another minute to the people to log on. Well, I guess we'll get going and uh, everyone can catch up when they join. I think you all know by right now that tonight we're doing We Should Have Been There, legendary black shows in Knoxville, uh, black concerts rather, and uh, finding with Black History Month. So uh, this is actually going to be a pretty fun and interesting one, uh, which Jack and I have got and Nicole have got for you tonight. Uh, of course, you know, or if you're just joining us for the first time, we're an educational nonprofit researching, preserving and promoting the history and culture of Knoxville. Because we're a nonprofit, we do rely on your support. So uh, thank you for helping us be a vibrant organization by buying books or making a donation uh, on online. Uh, if you go to our Engage page, you can find uh, all our um, recorded sessions uh, and also make a donation, as I just mentioned. Uh, if you go to History Happy Hour, that's where we've got probably 70, 75 recorded sessions already uh, from this series that we've done since May 2020. It was four years ago. Um, but tonight, I'm going to hand it right over to Jack. Take it away, Jack. All right. Thanks. Thanks, Paul and and uh, uh, and Nicole um, uh, for making this possible. And Paul's been a special help in, in finding some of the great images we're going to be showing tonight. Uh, it's uh, we're, we're it's Black History Month, and we're talking about the uh, the history of black performances, not people from Knoxville necessarily, but people who had a, made a memorable performance. In some cases, kind of astonishing uh, in retrospect to see who was performing here when. Uh, you could kind of tell the history of black music in America by hopping from concert to concert in in Knoxville uh, over. Uh, you know, period from the 19, early 1920s to, uh, I guess, the present time to some degree. But what we're concentrating mainly on the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s, a time when uh, Black people uh, were, you know, uh, no secret to anybody on this program, uh, uh, pretty pretty fiercely discriminated against uh, in many ways. And in many cases, these performers were not allowed to sit in the seats of the auditoriums where they were performing. They, they performed on stage for uh, audiences of white people. But we've also found there are many other arrangements too. There were segregated theaters. There were all black theaters occasionally, uh, all, uh, all white theaters and, uh, and different kind of ways to balance that uh, and uh, in different, uh, different circumstances. Um, but uh, let, we're gonna start back from the beginning. It was rather unusual to see black people perform on stage before about 1920. Um, and there were a few examples in, uh, up north, but not many. Uh, there were uh, uh, black lecturers occasionally, uh, uh, everybody from W.E.B. Du Bois to uh, Booker T. Washington and others uh, spoke to mixed race audiences in theaters. Uh, but for some reason, uh, not as they didn't perform as musicians on stage for for uh, for for white audiences, uh, but this began to change a lot right after World War One, uh, and uh, and and especially with the rise of this new music called jazz. We'll be talked by Mr. Earl Hines, who's kind of one of the surprises of of Knoxville history, uh, in a little bit. But we're going to go back a little bit before his time to begin with, and uh, at the very uh, at the very first, let's look talk about the venues some too. We're going to be showing talking about the people and the venues where they played. Um, yeah, this is uh, uh, Mamie Smith at the Jam Theater. Mamie Smith, uh, I don't know if you, if you know her work, but she was one of the best known blues performers of the early days. Uh, she did the Crazy Blues, uh, which has been covered by everybody <laughs> up to Leon Redbone. Um, but uh, it, it, that was one of the first jazz, uh, first black records ever recorded, black performer records ever recorded and it's strange to think that that was controversial that black people were putting their their voice on record uh and back in 1920 uh 1921 and this was a, a brand new thing she was a brand new recording artist and and controversial in some parts of the country when she performed uh at the gem theater uh and they uh and, and as you notice the gem theater was a uh, was a theater for black people uh down at vine and central uh, this theater, the place where she performed, might still be a, a, a building still standing. Uh, the later Gem Theater was was torn down, 
but uh, this is the uh, this is the Gem Theater. Uh, as uh, uh, anyway, it, it, I, I'm, I, I might be mistaken about that. If this is a 1921 picture, uh, this is the this is the Gem Theater that was torn down. Uh, but uh, but anyway, uh, it was a theater mainly for black people that had certain special shows for white people, as you see in the advertisement earlier. It said uh, special uh, special section for white people, and that's what they would do. They were expecting a mainly black audience, uh, but for white people who were curious about it, they were allowed in to uh, to hear the performance. But it's uh, really some kind of special that Mamie Smith was was here uh, so early in her in her career uh, as as again one of the very first black recording artists in America. Um, but uh, anyway, this is a, a great old theater uh, that was uh, right down uh, near where the, not far from where the, the uh, dog park is today, maybe a little bit uh, farther to the east of there. All right, this is one of the big surprises and she's kind of an outlier in this. Mainly we're talking about popular music tonight, uh, but this is Marian Anderson. And if you you probably have heard her name I remember uh, learning about her in elementary school at the, the very dramatic event uh, of her in Washington, D.C. in 1939, uh, when uh, a, uh, uh, she was forbidden uh, to sing at Constitution Hall in Washington, D.C. by the uh, DAR. And one particular member of the DAR who was incensed by the fact that Marian Anderson, uh, one of the greatest contraltos in American history, uh, was not able to perform that night was Eleanor Roosevelt. And uh, she she uh, she found a way for her to perform uh, in a much bigger uh, venue, and that was uh, the, the Washington Mall in front of the Lincoln Memorial. And uh, Marian Anderson, what, 25 years before King spoke at the same place, uh, was singing uh, for a, a very large crowd, a much larger crowd than would have fit in Constitution Hall. Well, the surprising thing is that 12 years, 14 years, in fact, before that, uh, uh, she was singing here in Knoxville at the old AME Zion uh, Logan Temple Church uh, at, in downtown Knoxville. This is down where, uh, about where uh, Mar uh, Marble Alley is today, uh, Marble Alley Lost. This is the old church that was there. Um, but uh, uh, this is the first concert that she did back in 1925, first concert in Knoxville. Um, and uh, this was uh, organized by a, an organization of black women called the Altruistic Club. And I would love to find out more about them. I'm not sure they were around for more than seven or eight years in the 1920s, but their their job was just to promote uh, black performers, basically. And they, they went and raised money to do that. And, and they did it first in this church. And then two years later, uh, uh, and the church concert was mainly for for black people, uh, but uh, two years later she performed in a in a mainstream uh, venue, and that was the Lyric Theater, which is the same building, same stage as was uh, Staub's Opera House of 1872. Uh, but this is where Marian Anderson performed uh, on Gay Street. It was right uh, across the street from the modern day Bijou Theater. Uh, where Plaza Tower is now. The building was torn down in 1956. Uh, but she uh, performed uh, there, uh, sponsored by the same group that had brought her to the Logan Temple two years earlier. Uh, so this is uh, uh, really something to uh, something to, uh, to 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 be aware of, that, that Marian Anderson herself played at least two shows in Knoxville back in the 1920s, uh, long before she became you know, a subject of national controversy. Uh, but these uh, the shows at the uh, at the lyric were segregated, uh, and they were segregated in different ways depending on what crowd they were expecting. And sometimes they would just have a rope down the middle of the uh, of the orchestra area, and white people would sit on one side and black on the other. Sometimes white people sat in the balcony if they were expecting a big black crowd. Uh, but this was uh, uh, I don't know how this one was set up exactly, but. Uh, but this uh, it's it's something that she was here. All right. This is uh, one of the big surprises. Earl Hines, known as Earl Father Hines, the great uh, uh, pianist, jazz pianist, was one of the early kind of seminal figures of, of jazz music, not just as a piano player, uh, but as a, as an orchestra leader. And the Riviera show is interesting. And remember, this is the same time the Cotton Club was going on up, up in New York. 
the Cotton Club uh, had only black performers on stage and only white people in the audience. And that I, I'm, I'm afraid to say is what the, was the situation at the Riviera Theater uh, the nights that, uh, that Earl Hines played there. And he played there several nights in, uh, in 1934. Uh, right before a movie, it says that it also advertises the movie in smaller letters that there was that she had to say yes was a movie that was going to be shown after his uh, his concert. Um, but this was uh, Earl Hines was from Chicago. He was Al Capone's favorite uh, jazz performer, uh, and Al Capone may have had a lot of uh, things uh, wrong with him, but his sens sensibilities about jazz were were right on spot on. Uh, Earl Hines was uh, just a brilliant pianist. And uh, he was the orchestra leader that got together uh, a lot of people in his in his band uh, connections that changed jazz music and pop music forever. Dizzy Gillespie and uh, Charlie Parker were in his band uh, later on. I don't think they were here quite this early. Uh, but uh, but anyway, I, I, I found this great d short description in the New Sentinel. It's not signed, but I, uh, I strongly suspect it's a guy named B.F. Henry, uh, who was a big jazz fan at the News Sentinel, uh, a, a reviewer, a jazz promoter, uh, later on went to the Washington Post and did some of the same kind of thing there. Uh, but he, B.F. Henry, born and raised in Knoxville, lived in Fortham Gill, uh, described the Earl Hines show at the Riviera Theater, which was apparently sold out every night he was there, uh, a haunting, pulsing, singing uh, syncopation, a tapestry of rhythm. Uh, that's the uh, old uh, facade for the Riviera. Not music as such, the release of souls full of a new music, a cascade of rippling, tumbling, surging notes from a seemingly dancing piano. <laughs> Can you imagine a uh, a new Sentinel writer describing something, uh, anything like that today? But but that was how Earl Hines struck uh, white Knoxvillians in 1934. Um, but that. Uh, Anyway, he was, like I say, here several times playing for both white and black audiences, sometimes both together in different uh, uh, situations. By the way, this is uh, the uh, this, uh, July 3rd dance, uh, pre-holiday dance and concert. Um, at, uh, at, this was at the Neil Savoy. Um, Neil Savoy was, um, uh, interestingly, a, a nightclub in Mechanicsville um, and a uh, uh, Neil was Neil Kanzler, I think her name was. She used the name Neil. It was her middle name uh, because she, I think, she didn't want people to know that a woman ran the joint. It, it, it was uh, so she used a, a kind of a neutral first name. Uh, but this was, uh, it was right on University Avenue. I think there's a church there now. I'm sorry, it's not so there. It was in business for seven or eight years. Was closed down during World War II for fire code violations. But during that short period, it had some of the great jazz performers in, in American history playing for mainly uh, black audiences. And sometimes, as you see on the left, white and colored uh, as a concert at nine o'clock, the dance at 10 was for colored only, as they say back then. But uh, but anyway, I, I wonder if Earl Hines knew someone here. He was a major figure, but he played in Knoxville a lot in the 1930s. Um, but uh, more than you would expect him to in, uh, in uh, any other any other medium-sized city in America. All right, another uh, guy who played here several times was Fletcher Henderson, who was a major figure in kind of the development of orchestral jazz and big band uh, jazz, Fletcher Henderson. Uh, but uh, but this was uh, uh, this was a, 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 a show at uh, at the Chihuahua Park Ballroom. Uh, this was uh, uh, the old uh, uh, the old uh, liberal arts building at Chihuahua Park, where the Jacob Building is today, up on the hill. We'll, we have an, a later picture of it, but it's uh, that's where he performed in 1937. But Fletcher Henderson was at least uh, as influential as. Uh, Duke Ellington, people whose names are better known today, uh, on the uh, kind of the course of of kind of orchestral uh, jazz, and uh, and uh, Louis Armstrong was here uh, a few times. This is, I think, the earliest uh, performance I know of his. He was what thirty five years old or so, thirty six, uh, when he played at uh, at the uh, at the same venue at, at Chilhowee Park, the old uh, uh, Exposition era building up on the hill um, that uh, he played for an emancipation dance. And that was every, uh, it was August 8th, typically. This one was on August 9th. 
uh, from 9.30 to 1 a.m. And uh, this was a, kind of a special thing. They had uh, a big uh, crowd of almost entirely black people would come to these Emancipation Day events. Uh, but, but of course, Louis Armstrong, if you, if you don't know, uh, if you know him mainly from the guy who was on TV in the 60s, uh, kind of a grandfatherly figure uh, singing sentimental songs and his uh, and his uh, kind of uh, scratchy voice, uh, you, you may not be aware that he was one of the leaders of one of the creators of, of jazz music in the 1920s and, and 30s, but was uh, was a, a very important uh, figure. In fact, I'm not sure we would jazz would be as popular as it as it became, if not for for Louis Armstrong. But uh, but anyway, he was here in 37, probably earlier. Uh, it's it's kind of a common name, so it's kind of hard to look look up earlier shows but uh, we know that he of course came back to the same uh, place different building same spot uh 20 years later uh into uh to shallow park um and uh had to a very different uh, kind of a setting but um but anyway yeah this is the building that he played in in 1937 that's the old exposition building and there was a ballroom inside that was built in back in 1910 for the exhibition exposition era and uh, was uh, uh, quite a quite a building. It burned, unfortunately, around 1940 or so, 39 or 40, and was replaced uh, by the Jacob Building that we know today. Uh, it's a much simpler building, and I think somewhat smaller too. All right, uh, so in that same building we just saw was a guy that uh, Chick uh, named Chick Webb. Chick Webb was a Harlem band leader. He was from the North. He uh, he didn't travel much at all. He had a disability, a spinal problem uh, that made him very short in size and, and it, was, it was hard for him to get around. So he didn't tour much at all and he hardly ever toured the South, but he came to Knoxville at least three times uh, in 1937. Uh, but uh, but a, a great jazz drummer, famous at the uh, Savoy Ballroom uh, in Harlem, uh, also played at the Apollo. Uh, but he, uh, as you notice on on the left, Chick Webb, one of the country's leading drummers, his novel instrumental quintet, uh, Ella Fitzgerald, well-known rhythm singer. Ella Fitzgerald was, he gave Ella Fitzgerald her start. Ella Fitzgerald was 20 years old when she performed in Knoxville as a singer with the Chick Webb uh, Orchestra. Uh, Chick Webb, uh, yeah, performed uh, at, uh, at a dance at uh, UT, uh, but also uh, did some other, other shows around. Um, but uh, but was you know at at the Chihuahua Park spot, but they were noticing even at age twenty that Ella Fitzgerald uh, that was getting attention in the uh, in the Knoxville Journal uh, for uh, you know, for the fact that she was performing and people I think some came out maybe just to to hear Ella Fitzgerald uh, sing uh, just a, one of the great the great early early or, 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 or mid mid career jazz singers. Um, but uh, anyway, uh, I'm, it's I, I never knew about this. She actually performed a uh, New Year's Eve show here in 1937. So that was uh, that was something. And it's interesting that she she was the the very beginning of her career. Chick Webb was at the very end of his career. He died uh, less than two years after his show at at uh, Chihuahua Park. So this is a very short time that the two were overlapping. That uh, Knoxvilleans. Uh, uh, black and white got to hear uh, Chick Webb and Ella Fitzgerald uh, perform here. All right, this is the one we're, we're talking about tonight who actually did have a Knoxville connection. Uh, this is Ida Cox. Uh, she was from Georgia and spent a lot of her life up in New York and a lot of her life on the road. Uh, but uh, but the, the, she did perform here at the Gem Theater in 1938, an all colored show. So white people were not allowed into this show. Uh, but uh, Queen of the Blues Singers, uh, she's, of course, famous for what made her different from other blues singers was that she wrote her own songs. And uh, this was uh, uh, she wrote like Wild Women Don't Have the Blues, uh, 60 Minute Man. Uh, some of them were kind of gamey, uh, gamey songs, gamey lyrics. Uh, but uh, but she was very well known in the 1920s uh, and 30s, uh, had a stroke at the age of uh, 50 or so and uh, retired uh, from the, the New York stage, but came back to live with her daughter who happened to live in Knoxville. She had come here to go to Knoxville College, I believe, 
and was a teacher here. And her her, her daughter had a had a had a modest house here, and they lived together uh, for some years. Her, the last twenty years of her life, Ida Cox lived here in Knoxville, performing only in church at the old uh, Patton Street Church of God. Uh, but she did make her only album, full-length album, uh, while she lived in Knoxville. She went to New York to do it, uh, but uh, with a Coltman Hawkins quintet uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, but this was uh, one of the very er the only times we know that she performed in in Knoxville was at the uh, at the Gem Theater in, in 38, a very rich uh, time for for jazz at that time. All right, here's the here's another shot of the Gem, and as it was in the in the late 30s. Right on on Vine Street, just barely to the to the east of uh, Central. There is really just uh, nothing but uh, but highway over the James White Parkway now. All right, uh, Cab Calloway played here a bunch of times uh, in uh, in Knoxville and uh, well, in in various venues. And uh, it's uh, it's it's interesting to see that that uh, that um, he played here on a, a particular. Uh, night at uh, on June 6th, 1940. This was an amazing night to be in Knoxville, Tennessee, because Cab Calloway was playing, performing at the uh, at the Lyric Theater, the big old opera house on the corner of Gay and in Cumberland. Uh, at the same time, that two blocks down the street, uh, Glenn Miller and his very white orchestra were playing at the Tennessee Theater. Uh, they were doing a national broadcast for CBS. Uh, it, it was only about 15 or 20 minutes long uh, before they went on to uh, play for a dance at, at the University of Tennessee at uh, Alumni Memorial. Uh, but Cab Calloway also did two shows that night, one a mixed race show at the Lyric Theater and uh, later on a, a primarily black show at, uh, at the club uh, back on off of state. Uh, it was actually called uh, an alley called Charles Street. There was a Charles Street Auditorium. Sometimes called Hodgson's Auditorium. Sometimes just called the Colored Auditorium. Uh, down in an area that's mainly just parking lots now. Uh, but but he did a, he did two shows that night, and the lyric one got uh, got the attention. Often you find that the shows aren't advertised in the in the main newspapers unless they allow uh, white uh, audience members, unless they're for white audiences. Uh, but here's here's the lyric theater uh, as it looked about the time that uh, that Cab Calloway played there that night when Nian and, and and Glenn Miller, who were very very different in their affect and uh, and their interpretation of jazz, were playing on the same street the same night. Uh, I, I just I'd, I'd love to picture that that evening, June 6, nineteen forty. All right, yeah, here's a here's a Cab Calloway, and uh, he was uh, of course much welcomed by the black community. And uh, and meeting uh, Dr. J. H. Presnell, who they called the Bronze Mayor. Uh, he was uh, he was not a uh, officially elected, but a guy who uh, had uh, the informal role of kind of kind of representing the black community in a time when black people were not in uh, in city government. Uh, again, this this is during that period between 1912 and then in the late 1960s that there were no black people in city government, but but do uh, Dr. Presnell was uh, the bronze mayor. It's uh, <laughs> the idol of Jive Cats to play in swing concert and colored dance. Uh, but uh, anyway, that that's a Cab Calloway, of course, on the right, and kind of a very outgoing guy, typical pose. And I think that's a, a pretty uh, good representation of, doc of Dr. Presnell as well. Presnell's office, by the way, was very close to the Jam Theater down on, on old, uh, old East Vine Street. And another shot of uh, Mr. Calloway um, a little bit earlier on. Um, this is, uh, I can't remember, is this, uh, is this an earlier or later show at Chalhowie Park Pavilion? Um, yeah, 40, a uh, later show, I'm sorry, 47 uh, at Chalhowie Park. Uh, and this was, uh, the pavilion, I think, was a place outside. I'm not, if anybody knows about what the pavilion was, I think it was a big tented area up near the Jacob building, uh, but uh, I would like to know more about that. I've tried to find out exactly where the Highway Park Pavilion was, uh, but he, uh, Cab Calloway did a show there, not his, not one of his first or not one of his last in Knoxville, but he's a very popular performer here. Of course, the Hottie Ho guy, but uh, all right, the Ink Spots are another very, very popular uh, uh, group from that from that era. They were more of a pop group than a jazz group, I guess. They sang in kind of a 
they're kind of like a, a gospel style almost, but uh, they were uh, somewhere between doo-wop and gospel, but uh, but we're doing, uh, doing uh, 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 we're very, very popular with both white and black audiences in the early 1940s. Uh, you might know their big hit song, If I Didn't Care, uh, but this, they're playing down at uh, Hodgson's Auditorium uh, at uh, Union Avenue, Charles Place, as it's, you're getting the address of it. Charles Place, again, was the alley that was parallel to state and central and running between those two uh, streets. Uh, they were they were at the very height of their popularity when they when they performed here in Knoxville. Hodgson's Auditorium, by the way, is named for uh, a guy uh, named uh, I think Edwin Hodgson, who was the nephew, believe it or not, he was a white guy, a nephew of Francis Hodgson Burnett, uh, the, uh, the author of uh, Secret Garden and Little Lord Fauntleroy. So you don't connect Francis Hodgson Burnett with jazz much, but uh, the young Hodgson, who was a musician himself and a songwriter, loved jazz and he he, he uh, liked the idea of, of running this auditorium mainly for black people and though they, they sometimes had shows that allowed uh, a lot of white here you see section reserved for white people at the bottom uh, and these were often uh, uh, situations where white people would sit in the back uh, and it was mainly a show for for black people all right mary lou williams was one of the, the great uh, uh, performers uh, piano player uh was uh, was here uh, a few times i think uh but uh glad to, to see that she's uh that she was represented in this she was playing uh, with, with uh, andy kirk the well-known uh, black uh, band leader he was a big band guy and that she was her his featured performer and one of his biggest drawing cards in those days uh, she went on to play with other several other uh bands after that it's interesting the way they have to phrase these things. Kirk has drawn bigger crowds to white dances here than any other Negro band. Uh, so this was a, for a white dance that they performed for in 41, just before World War II. All right, uh, and Duke Ellington was here several times. So I would love to nail down all the shows. Uh, but uh, but he, again, he was at Chilhoe Park. Uh, and this was, uh, when you see Chilhoe Park Hall, that was the Jacob Building in 1947. I have, uh, had hopes that uh, one of these two uh, uh, performances, and these were two different performances in the same year. Uh, one was in the building, one was in the pavilion. Uh, but this was, uh, I, I would love to believe that the first of these shows might have been when he still had a guitar player in his band uh, for about a year named Django Reinhardt. Um, I don't think he did, but I, 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 I'm open to uh, to a suggestion about whether that was possible at the time. But uh, but Duke Ellington, of course, was a, a, a major, major figure uh, as both a, a uh, performer on piano and uh, and a composer with his uh, right-hand man, Billy Strayhorn, uh, who uh, sometimes traveled with him. He was, uh, Ellington was here many times up until the late 60s, maybe even later in here, just playing playing for dances and things in Knoxville. Okay, here's a here's the Jacob Building we we're talking about earlier, uh, as uh, as kind of as it is today. It's interesting they don't use it. They used it a lot for live performances between when it was built around 1941 or two, named for a veterinarian, uh, Dr. Jacob. Uh, but it was uh, 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 it was used as performances for about 20 to 25 years until they just stopped using it for performances altogether. They sometimes had big public events. I think one of Madeline O'Hara's inaugurations was there, uh, but, uh, but and of course they use it for the fair and and for gun shows and things like that. But I, I don't know the last time they used it for a big uh, a big musical performance. Um, but uh, and I don't know why why that is, but uh, might might be that there are better places acoustically today. But uh, anyway, that's there it is uh, looking prettier than it, it often does. All right, and uh, and here's a. Uh, the Jimmy Lunsford band that was here a lot. Again, uh, as was the case with Earl Hines, he played here more than you would expect a guy to. He played here, you know, uh, more than a dozen times in the 30s and early 40s. This one is at Chilhowie Park, the place we were just talking about. Actually, this is the older, uh, the exposition era building, the, the big fancy building, one of the first times he, he played here. 
Uh, but later on, uh, he, as we, and, and oh, here he, we a picture of him. Paul found this picture I had not seen before of uh, uh, city manager George Dempster, uh, the inventor of the Dempster Dumpster. In fact, this was the year that the Dempster Dumpster was re released to the world uh, uh, later that year uh, that uh, that city manager uh, George Dempster uh, is shaking hands with J Jimmy Lunsford, welcoming him, him, him to town. Uh, Lunsford later played, uh, as Paul and I learned when we did the Bearden book, was late, later brought his orchestra to uh, the uh, armory at uh, on Sutherland Avenue in Bearden, and did a did a, at least one show there for a big crowd, but very popular here in Knoxville. He more uh, dance band, not as much a jazz innovator as Fletcher Henderson and and uh, Earl Hines and some of the others, but but uh, but very popular and and practiced uh, uh, jazz performer and, and orchestra leader. And he, yeah, here's another another shot of him. King of Swing is coming here. Uh, very. One of these people, it's funny, we remember some names better than others. I, I bet a lot of people who aren't uh, close to jazz uh, don't recognize the name of Jimmy, Jimmy Lunsford, but but he was a big name in the in the immediate pre-war uh, period. And another, some, a couple more, you see Neil Savoy, uh, and this is, uh, uh, again, that that place right on University Avenue in the middle of Mechanicsville that, uh, that had a lot of, a whole lot of great shows. And this was kind of in the last couple of years of its career. It says tickets at Miller's. You buy them at the department store downtown and George's camera shop. Uh, but section for white people at both performances, um, indicating that the main uh, thrust of the, the the main audience was black, but there were sections for for white people. Uh, so this was uh, uh, who were who were daring enough to go to Neil Savoy, which didn't always it was it was sometimes at all black shows there. It's a 600 chairs available at concerts. That's uh, that's remarkably a, a, a bigger place than I'd always imagined uh, Neil Savoy to be. And of course, it's probably named for the Savoy in uh, in New York, which was uh, Chick Webb's uh, roost. Okay, here are a couple of others. Uh, uh, and th th can you imagine going to a show and seeing Duke Ellington and his and his orchestra, Nat King Cole, and Sarah Vaughan, one of the greatest singers of that era, at the same show? This was this was one of those those shows at Chill Howie Park in 1951 uh, at at the Jacob Building. Uh, just 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 um, try to imagine that. Um, it's uh, it's uh, it, it's remarkable. Uh, and usually in the Jacob Building, what they did the uh, black people were on the floor on the, with the orchestra level, I guess, and they and it was, it was often a dance. And there was a dance floor down there, and white people. Uh, stood or sat in the in the in the mezzanine area kind of the balcony area kind of flipped the old uh the old uh, uh church routine of black people in the balcony but the pictures of duke ellington and sarah vaughn they, they uh uh nat king cole is is just as famous as uh, as they are uh, eventually but he was he was a young man uh, uh sarah vaughn was very young at the time sarah vaughn i think was only what 27 years old uh, at the time uh nat king cole was 31 or 32. It was just a, a, a hell of a show that uh, I, 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 if anybody's out there is old enough to remember that, uh, they're probably kicking themselves for, for missing it or, or remembering it fondly if you did make it. If, if you did remember any of these shows, and this goes through all of the shows, anybody out there, please let us know. I would love to hear, would, would love to hear anything about them. Hey, Jack. Yeah. I just interrupt, uh, interject rather, we have a question from Charles. Were the performers on a regular concert performance tour circuit coming to Knoxville, do you know, or were they one-offs? Or... Well, no, most of them were on some kind of a tour. Uh, just like today, you, you don't go out, you don't go from Chicago to Knoxville just for one show. You're you're traveling around. Um, so it's, uh, I, 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 I don't, I haven't studied them all, I know it, but in some cases, these, these were on, on tours. It was unusual. Uh, I saw a a a show about a, a documentary about Chick Webb, fascinating documentary that came out about five years ago, that actually mapped some of his tours around America and just showed him just dipping down in the South to Knoxville. That was the first time I ever heard that he ever even came to Knoxville. It was when they had a map and showing uh, kind of a spot in Knoxville and then moving back up north not long after that. Um, but uh, yeah, they're usually some kind of a circuit um, to, to make it worth their while. Okay, this is something, I don't know if you uh, all have heard the name of Sister Rosetta Tharp. She was the subject of a PBS documentary a few years ago. Um, and 
in in which uh, Sister Rosetta Tharp was she was basically a a, a gospel singer, a, you could call her an evangelist, perhaps, uh, but uh, was uh, performing at uh, at uh, Smithson Stadium, which is what we know as Caswell Park today. Smithson Stadium was the second of three baseball stadiums they were at Caswell Park over the years. Uh, but this was in 1951, too, the same year as that amazing uh, show uh, at uh, at uh, the Jacob Building. Um, but Sister Rosetta Tharp was an electric guitarist. And at a time when the electric guitar was not considered by most people to be a lead instrument in a, in a band, it was the idea of, of, of a solo electric guitarist setting out, getting out in front of a band and and uh, and improvising on the electric guitar. Uh, she may have invented this idea of, of what we know as shredding or whatever today. Uh, this uh, and and on this documentary, Keith Richards was was extolling her virtues as being a real pioneer in the in popularizing and innovating the electric guitar. Uh, so it's amazing that that she was here uh, playing under the stars, uh, music under the stars with a gospel uh, uh, group along with Marie Knight, who was a well-known uh, 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 gospel and R&B singer. So that was another one you wouldn't want to miss if you get the chance to go back to, uh, to 1951, Wings Over Jordan, uh, the, the world's greatest Negro choir. You know, a space for both Negro and white pa patrons. So uh, that, this was for everybody. They were trying to bring, uh, sit, build a big tent for, for, for everybody in the congregation for this. But, uh, but there's some amazing, uh, video of her if you get a chance to see that documentary or other things but she was a, really a pioneer of the electric guitar in in uh, in a way that's you know, partly jazz but partly kind of looking forward to rock and roll which didn't exist by that name at least uh yet in 1951. all right count basie whose name you probably heard he played here uh, quite a few times over the years even up into the 60s and maybe 70s but uh was at uh, chelway park Auditorium uh, again, the, the the Jacob Building, that uh, another that great year in 1951. Uh, but uh, Count Basie had, I think he played at Hodgson's downtown at least once or twice. Uh, but uh, uh, piano player and and band leader. Uh, my my dad was a big Count Basie fan. He has a very distinctive style that I could recognize in just a few notes. And we're getting to the rock and roll era. This is just the very next year, 1952, and that's when we get Fast Domino. Uh, and this was uh, Fast Domino was uh, was was uh, just beginning his career uh, in rock and roll. This is before uh, before uh, uh, Blueberry Hill and and uh, and a lot of the uh, and uh, a lot of the songs that he's best known for, but. Uh, he and uh, a guy named Lloyd Price uh, put together uh, a, a, a song called Lottie Miss Claudie, and they recorded that together. But I'm sure that uh, that he performed that at this at this particular show in 1952. I want to mention that uh, some people kind of like to deride Elvis Presley as the king of rock and roll uh, when there's so many great black performers did. And they always imply that Elvis himself uh, didn't didn't. Uh, didn't acknowledge that. But Elvis has been quoted by saying, I'm not the king of rock and roll. Fast Domino is the king of rock and roll. Uh, but he was, uh, Fast Domino was from New Orleans, lived a, a, a very long life, uh, and was uh, just a big a, a big early star of, of, of rock and roll in the 1950s. Um, show and dance uh, Saturday night. Um, but uh, see, they, these were dances. These weren't people just sitting. People would have found it boring in the 1950s to sit in a chair and listen to rock and roll. You had to dance to it. You, you had to, always had a dance. You didn't have a rock and roll show unless it was a dance floor involved. But uh, but that was uh, I don't know if they're actually calling it rock and roll that early. But uh, but he was really one of the very early innovators of it. All right, and here's uh, Lloyd Price, the guy I mentioned earlier. He was a collaborator with uh, Fast Domino in those days. He was one of the early rock and roll uh, uh, innovators as well, and he played here several times in the early 50s. Uh, he seems to have faded after that, but um, but uh, he was here uh, here at Chilhawi Park. All the times I know of were at Chilhawi Park that he was here. He was actually playing the night that uh, Hank Williams spent his last night in Knoxville uh, and, and that New Year's Eve uh, in 1952, 53. Um, and this, I, actually, this is referring to that, to that performance uh, uh, in, right in advance. 
but I, I have written that Hank Williams' car, uh, no matter which story you believe, his car apparently went down Magnolia right past right past Louis Price and his in his uh, live concert at uh, H. Howie Park that night. Hey, Not Jack, I'll that. interject again. Um, Elvis Presley's 68 comeback special, he does a terrific acoustic version of uh, Lordy Miss Claudie. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh, paying homage, yeah. Yeah, Elvis Presley was unknown at this time, by the way, 1952. He was, he was nobody. But, uh, yeah, here's an amazing show. Uh, just look at these folks. Uh, you know, the, the Clovers, who became best known maybe for uh, Love Potion Number 9. But look at, look at that. Fast Domino is on the same bill the same night. Uh, uh, Ruth Brown, one of the great uh, uh, early rock and roll singers. Little Richard, uh, Tutti Frutti, 1956. Little, Little Richard was you know, one of the really uh, uh, kind of out there um uh performers but uh but just an amazing lineup of, of performers and this became kind of a thing in the 1950s and 60s uh to have lots of performers traveling together typically and just doing a couple of songs of their own and and the yielding to the next the next one on the bill uh but uh but uh yeah little richard is uh was 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 one of the most daring performers of his of his time all right, another uh, Little Richard uh, show uh, with uh, uh, several uh, well-known performers, Etta James uh, uh, and, uh, and several others you might know, recognize the names of. Uh, also at Chihuahua Park Auditorium, a.k.a. the, uh, the Jacob Building. So next time you, you look at all the, uh, the canned pickles and stuff there, there at, uh, during the Tennessee Valley Fair, just think of all the, all the history that's been made in that, in that, in that same big big long room. All right, things changed a lot in, uh, in 1961 um, as, uh, as uh, all the, sh the shows at Chelly Park were segregated, um, at, at least up to, up to this time. Uh, and uh, things were very different uh, suddenly in, uh, in 1961 when the Civic Coliseum opened. Uh, they, were, uh, they were different at least in that one place. Uh, this was when Civic Coliseum opened in 1961. It was not segregated at all. It was uh, Robert Booker has, has talked about how when he walked in the first time, he asked the usher, "I, I, I don't see the white, the black section. Where is it?" And they said, "There's not one. You just take a seat." Uh, that this was uh, uh, this was you know revolutionary at the time because at the time, the Tennessee Theater, the Riviera Theater were still all white, uh, and this was for. Uh, and would be for another couple of years, but uh, but they had a lot of uh, a lot of black shows at the uh, at the Civic Coliseum. It's a it's it, I, I would call that a historic building. We've wondered about what to do with it in the future, but it's uh, it's it's it has had a significant impact on on Knoxville uh, Knoxville's culture. And one of the first uh, very first performers at the uh, Civic Coliseum was Mahalia Jackson, um, and uh, and that's uh, there she is. They uh, they say when she stayed at the Holiday Inn uh, for that performance on Chapman Highway, uh, that was was upsetting to some people, but kind of set the standard for what all uh, hotels were going to be doing in uh, in the in the nineteen sixties, uh, allowing both black and white uh, uh, patrons. And uh, okay, here's a here's a a, a hell of a show uh, just before the Civic Coliseum era. This was uh, they called a rock and roll show in 1959, um, and uh, this was uh, uh, all an all black rock and roll show with Sam Cooke, uh, the, the great you know great singer uh, uh, whose life was was too short, uh, but and Jackie Wilson uh, and uh, the Pips. Uh, Starring their their uh, lead singer, who's not mentioned in this, uh, uh, Gladys Knight was with the uh, with the Pips in in 1959. Of course, they were not really famous as Gladys Knight and the Pips until a, a decade or more later, but uh, but they were having a just a part of this really great show at uh, at at Caswell Park. Uh, this was out outdoor at Bill Myers Stadium. I can't remember who was the organizer. The Sam Jacobs was a local guy who, who promoted this this show. Uh, but uh, but different uh, different well connected promoters had you know effects on on Knoxville culture by bringing you know different kinds of music uh, uh, in, a, in a pretty good steady diet of it during this uh, during this period. 
but this is what people are just kind of getting used to, uh, getting used to rock and roll. Um, and uh, I would love to would love to uh, have been there or to to talk to someone who who remembers it. Okay, and this was uh, back at Chilhawi Park, uh, show and dance, uh, James Brown and uh, and the and the famous Flames. Uh, James Brown was from Georgia uh, and was just beginning his kind of early in his career when he played in Knoxville, uh, right at uh, at Christmas time, right after Christmas in uh, in 1960. Uh, this was the first I know of of several a lot of shows he did here. I don't, in fact, know of anyone even in country music who performed in Knoxville as much as James Brown did in the 1960s and 70s. Uh, he was here a lot. He was indeed the hardest working man in show business. Uh, but uh, but th th his very first show was uh, was this uh, was this segregated show. It's a section reserved for white spectators uh, at the Jacob Building. Uh, and he came back at the end of his career. I actually saw what may have been his last career, last show in Knoxville at the Homer Hamilton uh, Theater, which is near the Jacob Building in Chilhawi Park, uh, but was still <laughs> was still dropping to his knees at uh, in his 60s or whatever he was, but uh, but was still doing a, a, a hell of a show then, uh, not more than 25 years ago or so. Um, but uh, anyway, he was uh, 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 he later, of course, came here and uh, and founded a, a, a radio station, WJBE, uh, in night late 1960s. Um, but the Clovers again, the Spaniels, well known, uh, well known uh, performers, Nat Kendrick, uh, were here on the at the same show, um, and uh, people I think didn't know what they were into when they came to a when they heard about James Brown. You're kind of creating a whole new genre of music. It was R and B then. He kind of, to some extent, uh, created what we later knew as funk uh, in his unusual uh, presentation and style. And uh, back to the Coliseum, uh, Ray Charles uh, was was there a lot in the early days. I think he was there once once every year or two uh, for a long time. Um, and uh, Georgia, what I say, Ruby. Uh, those are he was already pretty well known uh, for for those songs. Um, it, it, interesting talent, of course, was the subject of a of a major motion picture recently, and uh, but was what was here as as often as any as any white performer was certainly. And Ike and Tina Turner were here uh, the first time ever in uh, at Chilhawi Park in 1960, uh, and uh, but came back again in 1962. And this is interesting uh, to see. Uh, and we know that the Civic Coliseum opened unsegregated in in uh, what's fall of 1961. Uh, but this is uh, this is a year later, more than a year later, and uh, Chilhawi Park Auditorium is still segregated. Um, this is because uh, a section reserved for white spectators. Um, but uh, but that was uh, that was the case. Mary Brown, of course, was a major, uh, major singer of the rock and roll era. Uh, uh, Tina Turner, by the way, had a had a local connection in that she was uh, her father had had work at, at Oak Ridge, and uh, when she was a little girl, uh, she had vague memories of, of dancing in the in the streets of downtown Knoxville for for nickels uh, as uh, as just a you know four or five six year old girl uh, here. Uh, but he they worked he worked here I think mainly during the war and uh, then moved uh, he, they were from West Tennessee moved here lived here for three or four years in the Knoxville Oak Ridge area and then and moved back um, but uh, but I don't know whether that was on her mind at all when she was uh, when she was uh, uh, performing with uh, with uh, her at the time husband Ike, Ike Turner okay well I appreciate uh, very much y'all joining us uh, we've uh, have have time for a question or comment or two or a memory. Anyone want to anyone see any of these shows? I would love to hear from you if you if you did. But, uh, but it's, fact, uh, who was it who played at the Armory in Bearden? I'm sorry, what? Who was it who played at the Armory in? That, that was Jimmy Lunsford. Yeah, and and actually later on Otis Redding did. Otis uh, we Redding. Didn't, we didn't get into his era. Otis Redding was here several times played at the armory once played at uh at bill Myers stadium once uh and the last uh in the last few months of his life he of course he died in a plane crash in 67 right after his newfound fame at the monterey pop festival um uh, 
but uh, he had been he had just played at uh, at the Civic Coliseum uh, a few a couple of months before his his untimely death. Um, but uh, but yeah, Otis Otis Redding was in all those different places. Also played oddly for a, a, the earliest show I've seen him play was for a UT Pepper Alley in uh, in '62 or so. Uh, so down on uh, behind the student center. Um, so you never know who you're who you're missing when you when you walk by a, you know, a show or a pepper alley or whatever.